no stigma attached to it, and it was an acceptable way to make money. When we look at the subject today, there is no dispute that Rhode Island was the Northern state most complicit in the slave trade, and Bristol was probably the most complicit town. Everyone knew about it. Most people participated in, in one way or another, but no one tried to stop it. Slavery developed in two directions. There was the business of slavery and slaveholding. It was the business of slavery which existed here in Rhode Island, which I am going to talk about tonight. Now, since we are coming to you from Linden Place, if I can get the slide of Linden Place up here, here we go. Since we're coming to you from Linden Place, for those of you not familiar with us, Linden Place was built in 1810 for $60,000 by George DeWolf, a third generation slave trader from Bristol. His ancestors, whom I will get into in more detail soon, came to Bristol in 1744. George continued to ply the slave trade long after it was deemed illegal by the US Constitution in 1808. And eventually he paid the price by facing bankruptcy. Linden Place is open to the public as an event venue today, as well as a historic museum. One of the events that brought Northern slavery out to the public eye was the acknowledgement by many of the leading universities several years ago of their history with slavery. And about 10 or 15 years ago, several books were written on the topic of slavery in the North. I'm going to leave you with a complete bibliography of the sources and additional reading that you might be interested in getting into when we get to the end of this talk. But this is one of the books that might interest some of you, Slavery in the North, the topic I just mentioned by Mark Howard Ross. Another such book is Dark Work, The Business of Slavery in Rhode Island by Christy Clark Pujara. In reading these books, I found many elements of New England history that I had never been taught. And these elements are still not taught in the average textbook today. In order to discuss this information in context, I feel we need to go back in world history to the 1400s. And this was when all the European explorers were traveling right around the world. Trying to hear them. It was they who actually started the slave trade by voyaging to the coast of Africa and returning to their native countries with enslaved individuals to provide right free labor for the entitled Europeans. It is not often studied that in the 1500s and early 1600s, the British, Dutch, Spanish, Portuguese, I don't know what happened to that, Portuguese and French were doing this trading for enslaved individuals, bringing these slaves from Africa back to their native countries. And you can see from this map that all of the travelers, the explorers from Europe would have sailed around the coast of Africa down to the gold and ivory coasts in this area here. Then it would have been a relatively easy voyage for them to take the enslaved individuals back to their native countries. These Europeans had built Fort Light castles as prisons on the African coast. And this is a close up of that African coast I was showing you a few minutes ago. The Dutch, developed the castle Elmina, the British developed Cape Coast Castle, and the Danish developed Christian Board near Accra. These European traders entered into business arrangements with the African tribal chiefs who acted as middlemen. And this became a business. The tribal chiefs were middlemen in this business. The Europeans left a few soldiers in charge of their forts, and the Africans would have sent some of their uh, fellow tribesmen into Central Africa to actually stir up wars in the interior. The losers in these wars would be brought back to the coast, kept in these forts to become future enslaved individuals. It is this one fort, Cape Coast Castle, which is still standing today, the one built by the British, and this is yet another book which has been written recently on the topic. Now, as I said, there were several elements that all came together to give us the birth of the Atlantic slave trade. The next element of the story is the discovery of the West Indies and in the West Indies, the development of the plantation culture and on the plantations, the realization that the, the climate was exactly perfect for the growing of sugar. Columbus, of course, discovered the West Indies in the 1400s. And as soon as the people realized that sugar could be cultivated here, 
it became a major cash crop for the Europeans who would settle the West Indies. They were trying to fulfill the desire for sugar, which had uh, developed in Europe. Uh, it had been, the sugar had been brought there by Muslims and Jews who had moved east, uh, west rather, I'm sorry, from their native lands. Sugar is a very brutal crop to raise. And the new plantation owners found that it was very difficult uh, to continue a, per, a long-standing labor source. They tried to use the native labor which was there, but it was found that human body could only take about seven or eight years in cultivating and harvesting the sugar cane until they needed a completely new supply of labor. And thus was born the supply of free labor by bringing some of the enslaved Africans whom the Europeans had been bringing back to Europe across the South Atlantic from, from Africa to the West Indies instead. This is a sketch of a plantation owned by Bristol's DeWolf family on Cuba. These would have been the cane fields. The cane would have been chopped uh, here and then put into a steam mill. It would have been steamed and turned into molasses, which was the first byproduct of sugar. As you can see from this slide, uh, this was from an Ash a National Geographic article from August of 2013 entitled Sugar. Back in 2013, it called it sugar was the oil of the day. I almost prefer to say sugar was the fossil fuel of the day because the more people wanted it, the more they used it and vice versa. And to take some of the statistics out of this slide, in 1700s, the average Englishman consumed four pounds of sugar. These numbers went up until it tells you that today, the average, in Amer the average American consumes 77 pounds of sugar annually, which is almost 22 teaspoons of added sugar. Quite a bit. Okay, by the time this sugar was growing, we're gonna leave the plantations in the West Indies and go to the third element that developed the uh, the Atlantic sugar, the Atlantic slave trade. And this was the settlement of America. The British had settled Virginia and New England. And here in New England, a farming economy had taken hold. But the English did not like to leave, live peaceably with their new neighbors, who at the time were the North American Indians. The English set up what I call almost like a scorched earth policy. Whenever they moved into a new territory, they wanted to immediately subjugate everyone that lived there. If they couldn't take them under their wing, they wanted to kill them or drive them away. This is Rhode Island for those of you who recognize it. You have Narragansett Bay here. And in this area, we had four native tribes, the Peacots, the Pockanockets, the Narragansetts, and the Mashpee Indians. And these were the four major tribes who the, whom the English proceeded step by step to drive out of their native lands. There were two major wars with the Indians in the 1630s and the 1670s. Some of the Indians fled north up into Massachusetts and New York State. Others fled offshore uh, to Martha's Vineyard, for example. You know that there is quite an Indian settlement on the island of Martha's Vineyard. Others, those who could not escape, were taken into slavery by the English and these Native American Indians became the first enslaved individuals in our area. Here in Rhode Island, the English turned all of Western Rhode Island into farm country. And they called this farm country Narragansett country. And it was filled with what they called plantations rather than farms. These farms or plantations did not in any way equal those in the South. They were much smaller in scale. But this, in fact, is what gave us the first name of Rhode Island. For many of you who are aware, it was originally called the State of Rhode Island and Providence Plantations. After the Black Lives Matter movement of last summer, Rhode Islanders put forth a bond issue for those of you who aren't aware of it. And in November, we legally changed the name from, Rhode I from the State of Rhode Island and Providence Plantations to just the State of Rhode Island, getting rid of the plantations part, which had such a bad connotation. These farmers who settled this area and farmed the area had actually entered trade agreements with the governors of the islands in the West Indies. And they provided them with the food for all of their slaves since they didn't want to waste any of the land that could be used to grow sugar. That was their crash crop. The Rhode Island farmers sent down pickled beef and pork, ground cornmeal, root vegetables, 
dairy products, including a lot of cheese. Browland was quite a cheese producing area, as well as now and then a few live horses, chickens, and cattle. They brought back from the West Indies tobacco and the major crop, which was molasses. I believe I mentioned before that molasses was the first byproduct of the sugar crop and most easily transported. For the most part, the farmers here in Western Rhode Island used enslaved Indians on the Northern farms. But of course, some of those Indians were stubborn seeking their own independence. This was their land, of course, and they of course did not want to work for the British who had now taken over. By 1638, the New England farmers decided to try to exchange some of these recalcitrant Native Americans. And on some of those supply ships that went down the coast, they started to send American Indians and they brought back on the ships from the islands some of the Africans who'd been brought over from Africa. This was the first use of Africans being brought to New England um, as enslaved individuals. The ships that came up from the West Indies, for the most part, brought up molasses. And along with that, some tobacco was brought, but molasses was the major crop, major crop that was brought up at this time. The Africans who were brought up to New England, for the most part, were welcomed by the native Indians as fellow enslaved individuals, and they helped them out whenever possible. Uh, from what our records are, there are no clear cut numbers of how many enslaved individuals were used on the farms or the plantations in Rhode Island. Historians do not seem to agree on this fact, but they seem to feel that it was between four and eight per farm. Rhode Island was not a slaveholding economy. They needed slave labor to support the business of slavery and the business of slavery was the buying and selling of goods. Uh, we do find records now and then about enslaved individuals achieving their freedom. And this is because when some of them were brought to Rhode Island, they were trained as carpenters, printers, tailors, bakers, cooks, farm workers, whatever. And eventually some of these were able to earn some money and thus either buy their freedom or become indentured servants and eventually buy their freedom that way. They lived in isolation from each other for this reason, they were not able to form any close communities. When you think of the uh, plantations in the South, there were large uh, slave uh, communities there, but this did not happen up here for the most part. The slaves were isolated. Some of them even actually lived uh, in, their, in their owner's kitchens. The trade between the New England and the West Indies plantations began to show these New Englanders who were farmers for the most part, that if they wanted to make more money than remaining farmers forever, they were gonna to need to expand their horizons. And to expand their horizons, they realized they were gonna to have to venture out of Rhode Island. Rhode Island is a coastal community. The entire sea lay open to them. For this reason, they decided to venture into the slave trade. In 1709, the first ship left Newport on a journey of slave trading. This first leg of the triangle trade, which is what the triangle route was called, took about 5,000 miles and it took two to three months. This would take them to the area of Ghana, which I showed you earlier. Once the ships got to the area of Ghana, they then spent another three or four months going into the forts that I also showed you and this is another close up of Africa. They would have sailed back and forth along the coast of Africa, back and forth, taking three or four months to acquire those individuals that they thought would become the best enslaved individuals for what they wanted to achieve. For trading for the Africans, they brought with them cloth, onions, rice, tobacco, beads, and fish. But very quickly, rum became the preferred currency. With the great amount of molasses that had been coming up from the West Indies, the distilleries in New England sprang up very quickly. There became 30 distilleries just between Providence and Newport. And in fact, we can document five right here in Bristol, which I will go into detail about later. Uh, Jay Cautry, who wrote one of the best books about the triangle trade called The Notorious Triangle, 
said that it was his opinion that if it hadn't been for New England rum, it was possible that there may never have been a New England slave trade. It's very possible it was either the water or the oaken casks that, used, that were used for the rum to after it was distilled, but that was his opinion. Once the ships had spent three or four months acquiring enslaved individuals, they then sailed what was known as the Middle Passage. And the Middle Passage was fraught with danger. The dangers were storms, disease, rebellion, mutiny. They never knew what might occur on this particular voyage. These enslaved individuals, if the, if the voyage panned out, would have ended up in Havana, Cuba, where the largest slave auction site had developed. Eventually, some slaves were also brought to Charleston or Savannah. In fact, quite a few were brought into Savannah, Georgia after the 1790s, when Georgia was still the only state which openly allowed the importation of enslaved workers. Occasionally, some enslaved individuals were brought all the way up back to New England. And the few that were brought to New England, namely to Rhode Island, since that's our focus this evening, would have been called privileged slaves. Privileged slaves, uh, the closest I can say is that it's almost like they were sold on consignment. Let's say if you were a carpenter and you needed a couple of new workers whom you thought you might be able to train in the art of carpentry. You might ask a ship's captain to be on the lookout for a couple of individuals of the right age who might be able to fulfill that desire. Or maybe your wife needed a new lady's servant. And so the same thing might have happened. You might ask for a young teenage girl, <clears throat> excuse me, girl to be sought out. And uh, she would then be considered a privileged slave. The privileged slaves were branded with a P on their shoulder and they were given privileges, as the name implies, on board ship. They were often given better food, more water, and a chance to sit out on, on the deck of the ship getting fresh air and therefore achieving the fact that they would be healthy when they got to Bristol. Now, during this period of early, early slave trading, a Bristolian named Simeon Potter decided to try this new venture. He had been following the coastal trade up and down from Bristol to the West Indies. His family already had a plantation on the island of Guadeloupe, and they had been going back and forth. At the age of 25, Simeon Potter happened to meet Mark Anthony DeWolf, whose family had been on Guadeloupe for quite a few years, for three generations in fact. Mark Anthony was 18 at the time, and there was nothing he would have liked better than a chance to leave the island of Guadeloupe. It, Simeon Potter, on the other hand, was looking for someone to act as a, par, as a partner, but also as a clerk with him so that he could expand his business, expand where he sailed to, and possibly get into a different type of, of merchant sailing other than just the merchant trade up and down the coast. Mark Antony had a very good education. He had gone to a church school on the island of Guadeloupe. He could speak several languages and he could do math. These were all skills that Simeon Potter was lacking in. In fact, Simeon was practically illiterate. He could barely sign his own name. Nevertheless, he uh, was very happy. Mark Antony took him up on the offer and Mark Antony willingly came to Bristol in 1744. Now, Simeon had an ulterior motive. He had nine sisters. And he also was hoping to be able to marry off some of his nine sisters so he would not have to take care of them with their father dead. He was the, the man of the house. He would have to look after them if they didn't marry and go off on their own. As luck would have it, as soon as Mark Antony got to Bristol, he met and fell in love with Abigail Potter, one of Simeon's nine sisters. According to the records we have here at Linden Place, Simeon saw his sister Abigail and Mark Antony married two months after they met. Over the course of their lifetime, Mark Antony and Abigail had 15 children. Three of them died before the age of one. Another three of their sons died in their 20s on ships voyages, but the remaining five sons all went into the family business, which eventually became the business of slave trading. Uh, just quickly to look at some of these family members, this was Charles DeWolf, the oldest of the next generation. 
Then we have John, William, and James DeWolf, the next youngest. It was James who became the head of the family slave trading business. And the youngest, although he looks rather elderly in this picture, this was the youngest of that generation, Levi DeWolf. These were the respective sons of the next generation whom they're sitting under. George DeWolf here is the one who I mentioned earlier who built Linden Place in 1810. Mark Antony, went on an annual voyage to help his new partner, Simeon Potter. And they went on an annual voyage. As soon as Charles was old enough, he went on his first voyage with the family at age 12. In fact, he was given the title of master. And this voyage was remarkable in that it took place in 1757. It was the first documented voyage on a Potter de Wolf ship to participate in the slave trade and it was a ship called the Phoebe. This is a picture of the family Bible owned by the DeWolf family. It presently resides in the Rhode Island Historical Society. I don't know if you can read what the cover says, but it was owned by the DeWolfs from 1724 to 1886. It was given to Mark Antony DeWolf by his mother when he left Guadalupe in 1744, it shows a lot of water damage because he took it with him on all of his voyages. As I said, he went on a voyage almost annually. And so he took it with him all along the way. And what's remarkable is that every open space in the Bible, he made notations. And if you can read it here, there are notations about when his children were born. So he no doubt came home every year and made these notations. Nancy was born March, 1759. John was born March, 1760. Letty was born May, 1761. This one says Monday morning, 1762, William was born. James was born March, 1764. Levi, the youngest, was born 1766 and so forth. A few years ago, we at Linden Place tried to borrow the Bible from the Rhode Island Historical Society but somehow our, our lines got crossed and we never got to borrow it for an exhibit. I hope once the pandemic is over that we can once again try to borrow it for a special exhibit at Linden Place. It would be really nice to have it for everyone to see. So the DeWolfs and the Potters then continued their fledgling slave trading business. And by 1774, Bristol census recorded that Simeon Potter owned 11 enslaved individuals. That was the highest number that any Bristolian ever recorded in a Bristol census. Mark Antony DeWolf and Charles each listed owning two slaves. So this was quite a difference there. Now, as the older generation got older and no longer participated in the voyages, Charles continued to captain many ships on his own and he was a lifelong ship's captain. He not only participated either by going on slave voyages or investing in them, but he also branched off into the China trade. However, it was his younger brother, James, who became the head of the family slave trading business. James was deemed too young by the family at age 15 to go on a slaving voyage. But since he was denied by his own family, he still wanted to try it. He ran off to Providence at age 15 with a couple of friends. And they signed on to a slaver about to leave Providence owned by the, the Brown family, Brown University Browns. The Browns before the Revolutionary War were quite active in the slave trade. Uh, and they had a ship going out, which James was able to sign on to. However, it was caught up in the British blockade as the Revolutionary War was about to start. And all of the sailors on the ship were taken captive. They were brought to Bermuda. And I've never been able to read how it happened, but somehow Charles and uh, James and his friends escaped at, in Bermuda. They got back to Bristol. They immediately ran up to Providence and signed on to another brown slaver, which managed to sneak through the embargo, uh, the blockade rather, I'm sorry. And they went out on this last slave trading voyage, the last one that was achieved before the Revolutionary War broke out in full force. Once the Revolutionary War was going on, all slave trading stopped. Now, up to this point, Newport had been the head of slave trading. Voyages were going out from Providence and Bristol, but most of them were going out of Newport. 
During the revolution, Newport was bombed, a lot of fires happened there, and their economy did not bounce back right away. After the Revolutionary War, as soon as shipping was able to get out of Narragansett Bay, one more time, James signed out, signed, signed on, I'm sorry, with a brown slaver. They made one last voyage on the Triangle Trade Route. He invested some of his own money in this voyage and was able to make enough money so that when he came home, he bought a couple of ships, convinced some of his brothers to invest with him, and thus became the DeWolf uh, slave trading enterprise. I've tried to stay away from statistics through, throughout this talk, but I just wanna show you a couple of charts here. This one shows the DeWolf family members who most actively participated in the slave trade. Again, jo James was the head of the family, George built Linden Place. Samuel is one of the three sons who died in their 20s on a slaving voyage. But the important takeaway from this slide is that 88 voyages were taken up by the DeWolf family from the end of the Revolutionary War to the end of 1807 when participating in slavery by in slave trading by Americans was forbidden by the American Constitution. This is another chart showing who the principal slave traders were after the revolution. Notice the absence of the Brown family. After the revolution, the Browns only sent out six or seven voyages, whereas once again, the DeWolfs together sent out 88, and you can see that all the other together didn't send out any more than 22. Bristol was now the heart of the slave trading economy. Now, during these years and up until 1808, Bristol thus was very a very active seaport. I have a slide here taken from my walking tour of what we now know as Bristol Harbor Inn. And this is a hotel built on the top of what was once the Bank of Bristol. Because Bristol was such a bustling harbor, the townspeople of Bristol worked at many support jobs to support DeWolf Enterprises. Many of them were sail makers, coopers, cutlers, rope makers. Even the farmers who provided food for the sailors on the ships would have been some of producing some of these jobs. Some of the people who worked for, for them were freedmen. Some were even slaves of the craftsmen performing these jobs. This was all the business of slavery. These people were complicit, but there was no stigma attached to it. For this reason, the DeWolfs formed this Bank of Bristol, and it was built in 1797 to encourage all of these craftspeople and entrepreneurs in Bristol to deposit their money. The DeWolfs would then use this money to reinvest in slave trading voyages, but yet they paid the investors' interest. The townspeople, of course, all knew where their interest was coming from, they knew where their money was going if they invested in the bank, but they wanted their lace curtains, they wanted their tobacco and tea, so they didn't care. They were living the good life, and at that point, they didn't care. Everyone was making money. Now, for those of you who don't know Bristol, this area that I'm drawing my pointer across, this is known as Thames Street, and this bank is on the corner of Thames Street and the top of what is now the DeWolf Wharf, uh, let me just put the next slide up here. This is looking at from the bottom of the wharf up. And you can see this brick building here. This is the Bank of Bristol that I was just referring to. This would be the street. If you were to walk down, I call it an alley today, the DeWolf Wharf, this building has been built as an inn. When it was excavated, the remains of one of those five distilleries that have been identified in Bristol have been found. And this particular distillery was known as the Finney Distillery. And the Finney family were related to Simeon Potter's mother's family. Thus, the Finneys were related to James DeWolf, and James therefore procured much of the rum that he would have sent out on his ships from this particular distillery. Um, let's see, there's one other slide I want to show you here. This is again from the top of the wharf area, the street looking down. The distillery I was just pointing out to you would have been right here. 
Back in the days of DeWolf shipping, water would have come to about this far. The ships could have sailed right up the slip in order to unload. This building is as it looks today. It was known as the DeWolf Warehouse. It is now the DeWolf Tavern or Restaurant. The warehouse was built between 1797 and about 1810. Um, the stone it is built from is all known as ballast stone. It came from either can, uh, Cuba or Africa, used as ballast on the ships. Once the ships had unloaded all the kegs laden with rum from Bristol to trade for the enslaved individuals, they needed ballast to balance off the weight in order to come home again. So this was building was built over time using the stones over the years. Now, back to this one for a minute. When this was excavated, they found the remnants of the distillery. And this historical marker is put at the foot of the DeWolf Wharf. I don't know how clearly you can make this out, but this is one of the hogsheads that was found in the ground that would have been used for fermenting the molasses used in the making of rum. And you can sort of see the foundations where these hogsheads would have been put. And this slide here shows that particular hogshead now in a historical display. If you were to walk into the DeWolf Tavern restaurant, the Bristol Historical Society has a small display and you can see this along with some other artifacts uh, about rum making and other elements of Bristol history. Now, in talking about the distilleries, a second distillery, which has been documented, again, for those of you who know Bristol, I'm sorry for those of you who don't, but um, north on Thames Street from this site that we're talking about are what are known as the Stone Harbor condominiums. One of the distilleries was found under the swimming pool area of the present Stone Harbor condominiums. A third distillery was located on a spit of land that isn't there anymore. In 1938, a hurricane devastated this area and it wiped out the intersection of what would have been Union Street and Thame Street. That was Bristol's first distillery site. A fourth distillery is believed to have been located uh, in the parking lot of the Tong Foon restaurant. And the fifth distillery is this one here. This was excavated in 2007 to 2010. This is at the corner of State Street and Thame Street. And you can see if you look closely, there's this rectangular vat, and you can see where there would have been other rectangular vats. This one was excavated much more completely. These are the vats that the molasses would have been poured into when they were brought from shipboard. A small amount of water would have been added to the molasses and it would have been allowed to ferment for 24 hours. After that, manually, people would have loaded buckets full of these, this slurry walked it over to the still. This is the brick still base, which was excavated during this excavation process. On the top of the still base would have been a copper pot and of course tubing and such, but it would have been used for distilling the molasses, turning it into rum. This is the base of another one of these vats. I do not understand why, but there was a round vat as well as all the rectangular ones. This is another picture of the same site. You can see the round still base a little more clearly and the round vat. And this is a sketch of exactly the way this distillery, the Pierce distillery would have looked. This is the street and this is that vat that was very clearly excavated. And you can see how many vats there would have been and this is the still. Once again, all of the contents of these vats had to be brought by bucket loads by hand over to the still. No doubt this labor would have been done by enslaved individuals or at the least indentured servants, but it's not likely that you would get somebody um, who would have been paid to do this job. Now, let's see. While all of this was going on, Everybody in Bristol knew that slave trading by Americans was going to be illegal by 1808 because of the Constitution. Many people, like James DeWolf, had diversified well before them. That's one of the reasons that the Brown family of Providence no longer sent out slave trading voyages. They had diversified as soon as the Revolutionary War was over, going into textile and other industries. James DeWolf and his brother diversified also into textiles. 
They built a couple of mills, one known as the Arkwright Mill, which was in Coventry, Rhode Island. And there was another mill in Dighton, Massachusetts. James DeWolf was therefore continuing to profit in the business of slavery by buying baled cotton from the cotton plantations that were still worked by enslaved individuals in the South. These bales of cotton would be sent north to his mills. They would mill the cloth to excuse the term, but to what was known as then as Negro cloth or Kersey cloth. This material was very coarse, rough material. These are some swatches of it here. And it was woven into rough clothing. This was an example of an outfit that might have been made for an enslaved individual working on a plantation in the South. This cloth was sold directly back to the plantation owners at a profit by James DeWolf. The plantation owners normally gave their workers, their enslaved individuals, either one or two sets of new clothing a year. So that's what this cloth was used for. In addition to going into the textile business, James DeWolf also became a legislator. In 1801, he went to the state legislature trying to stall the anti-slavery laws, but this was pretty unsuccessful. So he then went on to the US Senate, but he only served for four of his six years because he saw that he was not going to be able to forestall the anti-slavery laws. In 1820, he came back to Bristol and he had also found out that his nephew, George, who had been running the family business, had not been doing too good a job of it. George had gotten careless with the family enterprises. He was still sending out slave trading voyages, but he wasn't be being really careful about how he was doing it. He also was not managing the family finances very well. It was up to him to keep up the family finances. At that time, the DeWolf Bank had been paying their investors 25% interest. But George had not been doing a very good job of that. This is George DeWolf. He had not been paying a very good job of being able to fulfill the deposits for 25% interest. And this worried James. So he came back from Washington to try to take over and save things. During this same period of time, George lost two ships loads of slaves in, an, in a slavery expedition across the Atlantic. He lost all that potential income. He had a personal plantation in Cuba known as Noah's Ark, and it lost an entire year's worth of its cane crop. So he lost all that income. By 1825, he found he was facing bankruptcy. And rather than hanging around and trying to face the music, he fled. Uh, at this point, he took the whole town's economy down with him. A little earlier, I was listing all of the jobs that people in Bristol participated in in order to, do, to invest their money in the wolf banks. All of these jobs dried up. People had no way to earn a living and the economy did not come back for about 20 years. It was textiles which finally brought Bristol back again. In the meantime, James DeWolf had come back from Washington, as I mentioned. He ended up buying Linden Place from the bank to save it from falling into non-family ownership. And eventually he sold it to one of his sons. James DeWolf died in 1837. He is buried in this tomb, which was located in the back of the DeWolf family cemetery. Uh, if you know Bristol or if you plan to visit Bristol, the cemetery is located on Woodlawn Avenue in Bristol. As I said, this is in the back. And if you look carefully, you see that the entrance to James's tomb has been totally blocked off. They were no doubt afraid that people could either consecrate it or try to steal whatever might have been in it. So they made sure that it could never be uh, stolen from afterwards. After his death, his son, William Henry, became the owner of Linden Place. He had bought it from his father, James, just before James died. William Henry was probably one of James's most unfortunate disappointments in life because he never succeeded at anything. He did not like any particular occupation. He did not like the slave trade. He tried to get into whaling. He wasn't successful at that. Finally, the family managed to secure him a position as the next ambassador to Scotland. But unfortunately, as he set foot on the dock about to set sail to Scotland, he dropped out of a heart attack and never got there. Um, this unfortunately left his wife in dire straits. He was married to Sarah Rogers. So she was Sarah Rogers DeWolf and she had no personal source of income. She was thus left with Linden Place and no means to support it afterwards. 
For this reason, she began to start to rent it out. And while she rented out two parts of it, the first thing she did was to rent out the main house to William Vars, a man from Newport who turned it into an inn for genteel gentlemen. He also added a wing on the back uh, so that they could get as much income as possible. Sarah kept a room for herself up on the back of the third floor and she lived there for quite a while. She also, uh, she, Sarah also rented out this south uh, conservatory of the mansion and she rented, out to, rented it out to the, the town barber, Dan Tanner. And this is the story that I would like to leave you with. This year, the theme of Black History Month is the Black family, representation, identity, and diversity. And what I would like to do is tell you about Dan Tanner and his family. He's a person that I always refer to when I, gave, when I give tours of Linden Place, whether I'm giving a historical tour inside or a tour of the grounds outside. But up until last fall, we never knew much about Dan Tanner. We formed a large committee last summer and fall to dig into as much of Linden Place as we could to find the hidden stories that we didn't know, to correct misconceptions, et cetera. And Dan Tanner is one that particularly interested me. And so with the help of two colleagues, we found quite a bit of information that we did not know before. Now, one of my colleagues had the bright idea, I would not have thought of it at the time, to plug the name into Ancestry.com. And by putting Dan Tanner into Ancestry.com, he immediately came up with this very complete family tree. I don't know if you can read it clearly on your computers or not, but I will explain to you what is going on. This is Dan Tanner here in black. If we follow it up to the very top, this individual is named Scipio. And Scipio was an enslaved individual who, came, who was brought over from Africa. We do not know when. Based on his name alone, Scipio, I personally feel that he would have been named after the Roman general Scipio Africanus, who was the Roman general who conquered North Africa in the 200s BC. This particular family tree does call him Scipio Tanner, I think for matters of clarity, but as I'll explain in a couple of seconds, he would not have been known as Scipio Tanner at the time. Most other records just called him Scipio. This, I had read about Bridget Tanner, and when I first started to inquire about Bridget Tanner, before we did this deep dive into history, no one knew who Bridget was either. I had only learned that she was a seller of spruce beer and tallow that was used to waterproof men's shoe soles. Fine, who was she? Was she Dan Tanner's wife? Was she a mother? Was she a sister? No one knew until we finally found this family tree. It turns out Bridget was Daniel's grandmother. Another one of my colleagues, by reading Sketches of Old Bristol by Charles Thompson, found a couple of references to Jonathan Peck, and I'll get back to this family tree in a second. But Jonathan Peck, again, if you can enlarge this, good luck. But Jonathan Peck is listed as having seven slaves. In Sketches of Bristol, this is the 1790 census, by the way, the first true United States census after the um, American Revolution. Jonathan Tanner, his seven slaves were employed in his tannery. So Peck had a tannery where he employed seven slaves. One of them was listed as Caesar. This is Caesar Tanner on the tree. Caesar was the son of Scipio. Caesar is Dan's grandfather. So all of a sudden we've put this all together that Scipio, the enslaved individual, father of Caesar, who was called initially an enslaved individual, he might have bought his freedom, he might have been freed somehow, but his children were free, his grandchildren were free. Caesar was married to Bridget, whom again I, I'd heard about before. They had four children. James Tanner was the father of Daniel Tanner. Now, uh, Daniel Tanner had quite a few references in the local Bristol paper, the Bristol Phoenix, as the town barber. He first opened his barber shop out of his home on Bradford Street. Bradford Street is one block over from Linden Place. And he then advertised that he moved his barber shop to State Street, which is one block in the other direction from Linden Place. He also later opened a barber shop in the town of Warren, which is one town north of, Lin of Bristol. So he had a number of different barber shops and no doubt a number of apprentices. 
We know from our records at Linden Place that he opened the barber shop in the, the uh, area here in, in, at Linden Place in our conservatory. There was a sign on the conservatory that advertised his particular barber shop, but we were never able to find any references in the newspaper to his barber shop at Linden Place. He also was a caterer. If you wanted a clam bake, Dan Tanner was the person to call because he put out the best clam bake in Bristol, according to the records. In addition to that, his third marketable skill was as a musician. He played the trumpet, and there were quite a few references that every year he would have led a small band in the 4th of July parade. He had four children, if you follow the lines on the family tree. I'm sorry I cut their names off. But one of these was Louisa, who became a leading dressmaker in town. Basically, the family became quite complex. They had quite a legacy as business people in town. Dan alone was a, an accomplished barber, caterer, and musician. And just knowing about them really adds to the complexity and the history and the story of Linden Place. This is the, bio, the bibliography that I told you I would give you at the end of the talk. If you can take a screenshot of it, feel free to. Otherwise, I'm sure if you email Linden Place after the talk, we can send you a copy of it if you have no way to get a copy of it tonight. Before I finish, I would also like you to know that this coming summer, Linden Place is participating in the Rhode Island Slave History Medallion Project. This is a statewide initiative to make people aware of the historic sites which are connected to the history of Linden Place in Rhode Island and the history of slavery in Rhode Island. In June, a medallion will be officially installed at Linden Place and it will join other sites in Rhode Island such as Bowen's Wharf in Newport, Patriots Park in Portsmouth, and the East Ferry Wharf in Jamestown. All of these together accurately help tell the true stories of slave-related history. Susan, if you're there, we will switch over to you and possibly answer some questions. You're muted. Thank you, forgot about that. That's okay. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, if, if anyone has any questions, you can put them right in the chat function and we can go over them. People have been making um, comments and scary and sharing um, some information like the books and the bibliography as we went along, Phyllis, but um, we have we don't have any specific questions just yet. Is it um, so we'll just give everyone a minute. Um, yeah, we are very excited about um, the Juneteenth celebration at Linden Place. Um, we're excited. Charles Roberts is actually here this evening, um, one of the people from the Rhode Island Slave History Medallion Project. Thanks for coming, Charles. Um, and, you know, leading up to that, we'll, we'll have um, hopefully more talks, more lectures, and every week we are uncovering more and more information um, and stories, not just about the DeWolf family, but um, about um, you know the resilience of African Americans um, associated with Linden Place and associated with Bristol history. So it's been an exciting journey um, for all of um, all of us who are doing research. Um, there is some wonderful research being done at the Bristol Historical Society as well. So Susan, I, see, I, I see one question that it, I do not have the specific answer for, but I can give partial of an answer. Um, someone named Courtney wonders if there's a record of how many slaves the DeWolf family brought through Bristol. Uh, two things, a lot of slaves were not brought through Bristol. Once again, as I mentioned, most of the slaves were brought to Cuba. However, we don't have a direct number, no, of how many actually came to Bristol. But we do know that overall, Northern slavers, the type that I've been talking about, brought 106 enslaved individuals from Africa to the Western world. But we need to compare that number to the English who transported two and a half million to the uh, Western world. But this was over a longer period of time. Okay, Phyllis, someone else is asking if there are places where the slaves were buried. Did they have separate locations where they buried them in Bristol? 
Okay, we do know James DeWolf had a couple of slaves who became like family members to him. And one of them is buried in that family cemetery that I mentioned off Woodlawn Avenue, that was Ajua. And she was also married to an enslaved individual who became free. We do not yet know where he was buried, but we think it might be the North burial ground. Basically, my answer is no, I don't know where any others were buried. Um, possibly somebody else does, possibly the Bristol Historical Society does. Okay, thank you. The next question is, are there, are any of the descendants of the enslaved people in Bristol still living in this area? That would be wonderful to know, wouldn't it? It's too bad we didn't turn some of that up in our investigating in the fall, but we don't know that yet, but we're still digging. We are still digging. We have um, one volunteer in particular who is really going down the rabbit hole and trying to find um, descendants of enslaved people in Bristol specifically. It's, it, it's not easy information to come along. Um, some of it, it almost need, you need someone who has a professional background in research to sometimes get to the depths um, of information, but we're getting there. We're working yeah. on it. Yeah. So, um, next question, um, Phyllis, is did James DeWolf throw a slave overboard? Yeah, I didn't want to get into all the James DeWolf stories here. Yes, he did. I would suggest that if you're really interested in that story, you read the biography of James DeWolf by Cynthia Johnson. Um, you'll get all sorts of other, other stories about James, but yes, he did. Uh, the person had contracted smallpox and they wanted to keep her from spreading it to the rest of the uh, population on board the ship at the time. Next question is, will you have walking tours this summer? Susan, will we? <laughs> yes, absolutely. I hope so. Phyllis, if you are willing and able, we will be doing walking tours. Yeah. Um, I, I think we typically start in May. That's when the weather's agreeable enough to do so. Um, I have to say it's, it's a really um, interactive experience, much so than presentation wise, um, you know, this, this fills that void pretty well, but there's nothing like experience, experiencing the tour together and in person, uh, much more interactive. Um, keep an eye out. We usually do um, one or two, usually I think two a month, correct, Phyllis? That's the schedule we were, we were on. Yeah, and that, that way we have enough interest, I think, too. Yeah. Yeah, um, okay. So someone's asking if the presentation will be archived on our website and available. Yes, it will be. Um, so you might have to give us a day or two to um, post it and get it up, but we should be, um, we should have that up very shortly for anyone you think might be interested. Okay, questions are coming in. Um, lots of comments. Um, let's see. There's some great information here um, about some additional um, sources of information. So um, thank you everyone for sharing and every, I invite everyone to look at the chat to get that info. Um, okay, question, is Potter's Cove on Prudence Island any relation to Simeon Potter? Prudence Island has a history of slaves. I don't know, but I would assume, you know, anything with the Potter name since he had a long maritime history. He was involved in the Gas Bay Affair, for those of you who are familiar with that element of Rhode Island history. So it very well might also have been named after him. I don't know for certain. Better to be honest. Do you have any knowledge of what some of the free Africans accomplished during this era? Specifically, I'm not sure what that person is looking for for information. I mentioned all of the different things that Dan Tanner participated in. We know of a couple of other free Africans who lived in Bristol. There was one called um, Carrington Palmer who lived up on Hope Street and he was an accomplished carpenter. Um, I would say many of them were workmen. I do not have specifics on any of them because I, I tend to deal with the earlier history than that. And that's that this is an important question um, and something that we're really delving into. Um, traditionally, you know, we've talked a lot about um, 
you know, the intricacies of the business practices of the dual family and how they made their money and how the, the tentacles went out into every area of the Rhode Island economy. Um, but now, you know, part of Linden Place's reinterpretation, um, we're trying to figure out more of these stories. And I have to say the Bristol Historical Society is doing a wonderful job um, really unveiling some of the personal accomplishments and stories of, of free Africans in Bristol. So stay, stay tuned. Susan, I see someone is asking a question about how does this real history get into history books and someone else added and into the public school curriculum. I know Bristol tries to include this history in their curriculum. I believe they start in the fifth grade, but I'm afraid that politics is what keeps it out of traditional history books. Um, in order to get it into a, in a mainstream history book, I think a lot of things in the world would have to change, unfortunately. Yeah, I, I do yeah. know um, that curriculum in, in Rhode Island has, has come a long way. I believe it's yeah. fifth and sixth grade. I think it's also um, being um, much more talked about at the high school level. Rhode Island Historical Society has really led the way in providing detailed curriculum for teachers looking to, um, you know, engage and teach their students about the history of the slave trade in Rhode Island and in the North. Um, so I think that is changing. It might be a little slower than we would like to see, but, but it's happening. Yeah. Okay. I think, I think looks like any last minute questions before we, before we sign off. Um, you know, I, I would like, you know, to invite all of you to, if this is, um, you know, if you're interested in, his, in history, if you're interested in Bristol history, DeWolf history, the history of the slave trade, and you'd like to get involved, we are always looking for volunteers. We're always looking for help um, in researching. And um, when we launch our tour, um, our new reinterpretation tour in the spring, um, we hope you'll come and give us your feedback because we do hope to share um, some really um, different stories that you might not have heard before, um, information about you know, the lives and experiences of, of both enslaved people and um, free Africans um, in, in Bristol and associated with Linden Place. So thank you, Phyllis. Um, thank you so much for everything. Thank you all for, um, for attending and um, have a great night. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. <laughs> Thanks, Charles. Thanks for coming. Oh, well. Thanks, I, Susan. I just want to say that this is going to be a fabulous event on Juneteenth. I mean, we picked a, a holiday, a Black uh, a, a holiday to do such an event and really celebrate the history of uh, Bristol and all that actually, even though it's about slavery, has contributed to American history. So it's a uh, really a privilege to be able to have this uh, celebration of our history in Bristol. Thank you. Thank you so much. We're thrilled and we're, we're really looking forward to planning this event with, with your committee. <laughs> and we hope you'll all join us. So mark your calendar, Juneteenth. Okay. All right. Well, thanks again, everyone. Have a great evening. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Phyllis.